Ruchem Aboyan. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, welcome to our home. Tonight will be a continuation of last week. Uh, we are dealing with leaders. Last week we touched on certain traits, positive attitude, compl compl being complimentary, patience, communication, honesty, confidence. Well, you think that'd be the end. Well, it's not. There are many things that we need to learn, and uh, hopefully we'll go through these traits that we should all cultivate to be better leaders in all the arenas that we in life have to encounter. <clears throat> so the next trait that I'd like to deal with is consistency. I think this is another important trait that a leader must possess. I always say I don't care if a skunk stinks, but what bothers me is when a squirrel stinks. Consistency. If you know what to expect, whatever it is, you can deal with almost anything. However, when there is inconsistency, then life becomes a nightmare. You know, I served in the U.S. Army from 68 to 70. My drill sergeant in basic training, uh, his moods were up one day, down the next. He was totally inconsistent, a wreck. Our platoon was a reflection of his leadership. There was another platoon, the 4th platoon, that was in my company, and their drill sergeant was tough, but fair and consistent. Their platoon was a reflection of his leadership. They marched better. They looked better. It was impressive. The power of a good leader. When you have to prepare for everything, many times, what you prepared for is nothing. Whatever goes on in your personal life as a leader, keep it there. Try to make yourself a robot, not emotionally. But try to be robotic in your actions. Be consistent around those that you lead. People like to know what to expect. People can adapt to almost anything that is consistent. It is inconsistency that brings havoc into our lives, also into our relationships. People who have set routines are much easier to follow. Life becomes easier for them and also for those around them. That is what a religious lifestyle is really all about, consistency. We see that the praise of Aaron, Aaron the high priest, was he, that, as we read in the fourth book in the Torah in the portion of Baal Losecha, that Aaron was given the honor of lighting the menorah in the tabernacle daily. And Rashi tells us that for all the years in the desert, it was he, Aaron, who lit the menorah, and that he never modified the service. He never innovated if you break down all of Judaism to one word, that word would be discipline. We practice religion and we bring its power into the secular world. Religion gives us the strength and determination to do what we have to do, what we have to do, not what we want to do. God has given us his Torah for us to learn the power of discipline, a trait that we all must develop, cultivate, especially our leaders. Next trait, attitude. This is a quality that goes a long way in making people like you. Take nothing for granted. Treat every favor that is done for you, whether large or small, with warmth and sincere words of gratitude. The words thank you should constantly be on your lips. You know, we see in the Torah that when it came to bringing up the plagues from the Nile or the land, Moshe did not participate. Reason? He still felt a sense of gratitude towards both. The water had floated his cradle when Miriam, his sister, had placed it in the Nile. And the land buried the body of the Egyptian whom he had killed. So since they had helped him many years in his past, he felt a deep sense of gratitude towards them. Even our name, Jew, comes from the Hebrew word Hoda, meaning thank you. Yehuda was a name that Leah gave to her fourth son. She knew that there would be 12 sons born to Yaakov, and she assumed that each of his four wives would bear him three sons. When she gave birth to his fourth son, well, then she wanted to thank God for her extra portion, ergo Yehuda. You know, body language is many times even more important than the words that are spoken. When you speak to someone, smile. Look, look at look the individual that you're speaking to in the eyes. Make eye contact. Don't shuffle around like you have weak kidneys or you have someplace to go. Give them your full and undivided attention. 
Well, the same holds true actually for larger groups. Look around. Use your body to convey your message. Express your concern and your joy. Let them know that you want to share with them as equals. Make sure that you're talking with them, not down to them. Taking responsibility. A trait that is essential that a leader have the strength of character to be able to admit that they have erred. Making a mistake is not the worst thing that a leader can do. However, trying to deny it, pushing the blame off on someone else, or just trying to justify the error are not acceptable. When the Torah discusses the sins of a leader, it states in the book of Leviticus 4.22, states there, Asher Nosi Yechete, it uses the Hebrew word Asher, which translates to mean when, when a leader will sin, a definite. However, with all other individuals that sin, the Torah uses the Hebrew word im, if, possibly. As it says in the classic German novel, Faust, as long as a man lives, he will err. Don't be afraid of failure. After all, that's how we grow. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. Whenever I reprimand an employee and I see that they're sorry for their action, I tell them that they should use the negative situation as a positive. I ask them, if I ask you to jump as high as you can, what's the first thing that you're going to do? Well, they usually answer, jump. I say no. First thing you're going to do if you really want to jump as high as possible is to bend down. The lower that you bend, the higher you will be able to jump. Everything in life has within it an opportunity for growth. We just have to identify and then utilize the information properly. We see with King David that when he was confronted by Nussan the prophet concerning his relationship with Bathsheba, he could have denied the sin or given justifiable excuses for his actions. But he did neither. All he said was one word. Chatosi, I have sinned. Accept responsibility. It takes a long, lead, strong leader to admit their error, as we see with Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher. In the book of Leviticus, in the portion of Shemini at the end of chapter 10, Moshe accuses his brother Aaron of not following God's command. After hearing Aaron's explanation, Moshe admits to Aaron that it was he, Moshe, who had erred and that Aaron was correct in his actions. In fact, the chapter ends with the Hebrew words, Moshe heard, and Vayita Ba'aino, which means, and it was good in his eyes. He approved, leading by example. Another trait is to delegate. No one person can lead alone. In fact, for one, if you have no followers, then you're not a leader. To lead successfully, you must delegate, train others, and build up your team. The saying goes that if you give a person a fish, you've given him dinner. But if you teach him how to fish, well, you've fed him for his whole life. The better you are at training people, the easier and more successful your leadership will be. This fact holds true from the basic family structure to the upper echelons of corporate America. As I heard from the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, good leaders create followers. But great leaders create great leaders. As we see in the Torah, Moshe grooms a nation to be leaders, but he grooms Yoshua to be a great leader. It would be Yoshua, Joshua, who's Moshe's protege, who would be, be the one to lead the Jewish nation in their conquest of the land of Israel. Yoshua became an extension of Moshe, our teacher. God shows us the importance of delegating by virtue of the fact that he, he employs angels not only that, Torah tells us that God conferred with the angels before he made man, as it states in Genesis 1.25, Na'ase Adam, let us make man. The wording of this verse is teaching us that we should always try to bring our subordinates into the decision-making process. By doing so, you make them feel like they are a part of the team. Doing so hopefully inspires them to grow and contribute. Delegating to others show that you have confidence in their abilities, which gives them desire to contribute. 
The results can be a greater feeling of camaraderie, which benefits all those that are involved with, as we've mentioned before, the idea of it, the idea at hand. Ego, a trait that is counterproductive in being able to motivate others. It gives others the feeling that it's all about you. Don't take too much of the credit for your successes. After all, success belongs to God. All we have is effort. Effort will always be rewarded by God. However, man can only make their judgments based on results. Effort is admirable, but it doesn't pay the bills, at least not here on earth. Wherever your ego edging God over, whenever you do that, you become a self-made man who serves as creator. You have to become, you have, you have become an idol worshiper. In order to be successful in life, it is essential to bring God into the equation, since he is the true source of all successes. Passion. You know, I think this was one trait, maybe more than any other, that differentiates a great leader from a good leader. The ability to reach not only deep within the hearts and minds of their followers, but even more so to be able to reach deep within their own heart and mind. Being passionate reaches people on an emotional level, giving them a desire to connect and merge together as one unit. Passion trumps logic. It's a powerful motivator. You know, they tell a story of a great rabbi who would see people in private audiences for guidance in both spiritual and worldly matters. Blessings for wealth and health and children, the list goes on. But people also came to him with feelings of contrition, wanting help to overcome their challenges in life. They were asking him to show them, guide them, on the path of godliness. It happened that after one such audience, the Rebbe told his shamus, his attendant, that he would not see any followers until further notice, and with that, he closed his door. And the shamus didn't really know what to do. So three days go by, and the Rebbe finally opens the door of his study and tells the shamus, that he will now see people again and to bring in the next person on his list. At the end of the night, all the petitioners were gone. The shamus turns to the Rebbe and he says, three days, three days. And the Rebbe looked at him with understanding and compassion. He said to him, when people come to me with a problem, an addiction, when they have been taken over by their passions, I look within myself to find that sin, that desire, and then I'm able to help them on their struggle with their challenge. Three days ago, someone came in and told me about such a deeply troubling state of evil and temptation that it took me three days to find it within myself. Then I was able to help him. An example of the deep concern and connection that our leaders expressed, even to the lowest of us, even those with the most grievous of sins. They truly care. If you look into the Torah, we see that God wanted to destroy the Jewish nation after the sin of the golden calf. God told Moses that he would start a new nation from him. Moshe re replied to God in the second book of the Torah, in the portion of Kisisa, 32-35, was very simple. If you don't forgive them, then erase me from the book that you have written. A true sign of a great leader. A great leader makes us better. He becomes the heart and brains of our collective being. He makes the improbable possible. Special times call for special leaders. Our sages tell us that God always looks out for our needs. We see that he has placed the greatest leaders and generations that have the greatest challenges. Torah tells us the Jews who left Egypt had fallen to the 49th level of impurity. They could no longer help themselves. They needed a leader on the spiritual level of Moshe, the greatest of all our leaders, to take them out of Egypt. They needed him to teach, inspire, and guide them on their journey through the wilderness. We also see that in our generation, we were blessed with the leadership of the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Nachman Mendel Schneerson, a great leader who was able to teach, inspire, and guide a lost generation out of the 
ashes of the Holocaust. He was able to help them find their way out of the darkness and to the light of Torah and mitzvot. The Rebbe was able to inspire a generation with hope and dignity in an uncertain world. Just like Moshe, our teacher, the Rebbe cared for each and every Jew wherever they lived in the world. To him, every Jew was important. The Rebbe's emphasis was on the number one, the importance of not only every Jew, but every person living on earth today, Jew and non-Jew alike, connecting and serving the one and only God. Nothing's an accident. It so happens that this Sunday will be the 27th Yorzeit, commemoration of the Rebbe's passing, which will be observed by all of his thousands of Hasidim followers all over the world. The Rebbe taught us with his mitzvah campaigns that each of us is a leader, that whatever limited knowledge we may possess, there is someone else whose knowledge is even more limited than ours and whom we can teach whatever we have learned. The Rebbe possessed all of the qualities that I mentioned in addition to total and complete dedication to God Almighty and all of his people. The trait of humility, a trait that is very precious in the eyes of God. You know, we bow four times when we recite the standing prayer, the Amida. The high priest, the Kohen Gadol, bows at the beginning and end of each of the 18 blessings. The king bows at the first word, Baruch, blessed, and remains in a bowed position until the last word, Shalom, peace. The greater the man, the greater the humility. The king was required to write two Sifrei Torahs, two Torah scrolls. One he kept in his treasury, and the other he kept on his person at all times. It was to be a constant reminder that he too was a servant of the one and only God. Another connection between Moshe, our teacher, and the Rebbe, a blessed memory, was their great humility. When Moshe was approached by God and told his mission would be to take the Jews out of Egypt, Moshe refused. Moshe told God, choose someone else. God had to argue with him for seven days before he agreed. And so too, after the death of his father-in-law, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchok Schneerson, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Hasidim asked the Rebbe over and over again to take over the leadership of the Lubavitcher movement. He refused. They asked him again and again for a whole year. Finally, with tears in his eyes, he begged his followers, choose someone else. So, finally, with great reluctance and humility, one year after his father-in-law's passing, the Rebbe accepted the mantle of leadership of the Lubavitcher movement. An act of leadership that changed not only the Jewish world, but the whole world at large. And just like Moshe, our teacher, he was a leader to all of God's children. As Hello State states in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, Chapter 2, Mishnah 5, B'makom she'en anoshim hishtadalios ish. In a place where there is no man, strive to be a man. There are times and places where we have no choice but to take charge and become a leader. We see in the second book of the Torah in Exodus 2.11, it states that Moshe went out among his own people. Vayar ish Mitzri, Maki ish Ivri me'echa. Moshe, he saw an Egyptian man trying to kill one of his people. And the verse continues and says, And Moshe looked, Chov this way and that, Vayar ki ein ish, and he saw there was no man. What he saw in reality was that no one was coming to the aid of the victim. So Moshe took charge. But Yaak is on Mitzri, and he killed the Egyptian. As the verse in Pirkei states, in a place where there is no man, where no one is taking an initiative, then take charge. You cannot stand by idly and let another person become, be beaten to death. Be a leader. The Torah tells us very clearly in the third book of the Torah in Leviticus in the portion of Kedoshim, 1916, where it states, Lo sachmod al dam re'acha. Do not stand by when your neighbor's life is in danger. We cannot put our hands in the sand, pardon me, our heads in the sand, and ignore the plight of our people. Today we must be advocates for our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel. 
We cannot stand by idly while they are being physically attacked by the Palestinians and verbally attacked by the rest of the world. But in reality, most of us are not, nor will we ever be called upon for such a mission of leadership. However, we are all leaders in some arena, whether it is at home with our families, at work with our employees or co-workers, or just hanging out with our friends. There is always a pecking order. Some people are just naturally drawn to step forward and take charge. Some, some people are just naturally, probably others are totally content to let them do so. Most of us have that choice. However, when it comes to ruling over our own feelings, our emotions, well, then there's no choice. We all have to be accountable for, our, for the decisions that we make. Many times we make our decisions based on convenience, short-term gains, monetary gains, or momentary satisfaction. We need to emulate God Almighty and do what is right. Right, not easy. Look at the big picture rather than settle for instant gratification. Be godly. When we focus on the we in life instead of focusing on the I, then we can help to make the world that we live in a better place, a happier place. As I look around the world today, I don't see Moshe, our teacher, or the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So what are we to do? The only thing that we can do, lift our eyes and our hearts up to heaven and use the power that we as Jews were blessed with. As it states, kol kol Yaakov, the voice is the voice of Yaakov. We must cry out to our Father in heaven, a cry from a child in distress to his loving Father is never ignored. So we have looked at all the qualities that a great leader should possess. What if a leader doesn't possess all of them? We see in the Torah, in the second book of the portion of Yisrael, there, Yisrael gives his son-in-law, Moshe, advice on choosing competent leaders. Yisrael mentions four character traits that he felt were essential for leadership. Moshe was only able to find 1,000 people that possessed all four. But we see, nonetheless, that he appointed another 87,000 leaders. So Moshe was telling us that leaders do not have to possess all human attributes to lead. They don't have to be perfect, but they need to strive to possess at least some of them. You know, some qualities are timeless and others are special, needed for difficult moments in time. For example, those qualities that we look for in a military leader may not be the same qualities that we, we, we may want for a political leader. However, some traits are universal to any leader in any arena. The most important trait that a leader must possess is an open mind, a desire to grow. People admire a leader that is willing to grow, to learn, to listen, to get better at leading his followers. There is one trait that I have left for last, which I believe is key to being successful. I have learned it from possibly the most successful person in history, the devil, or evil inclination, or the sultan. What makes him so successful? Hmm. Perseverance. He never gives up. He just keeps coming. He is the energizer bunny. He is a marathon runner and we are all sprinters. In the race of life, the marathon runner will always win in the end. So we need to learn from the devil's success <clears throat> that we too need to be marathon runners. We need to stay the course we need to remember the game isn't over until we give up. Never give up. As Riptarfin states in Pirkei Avos, The Ethics of the Fathers, Chapter 2, Mishnah 16, Lo Allah hamalach ligmor. It is not incumbent upon you to complete the work. They say that when, when General George Patton was fighting the general, German General Rommel in the African desert, he was reading the book that Rommel had written on tank warfare in the desert. <laughs> Patton exclaimed, Rommel, you're a genius. He defeated Rommel, or maybe Rommel defeated himself. We need to beat the devil at his own game by using his playbook, perseverance. 
We need to realize that somehow today we are in a wilderness. We too need to connect to our source, our strength, just like our ancestors. Somehow our world today has turned into a wilderness before our very eyes. So just as our ancestors in the desert put their faith in God, as it says in the fourth book of the Torah in the portion of Halosko, Al pi Hashem Yaakonu al pi Hashem Yisau. By the word of God they camped, and by the word of God they traveled. This phrase is mentioned three times in the end of this chapter. The number three in Judaism is important in that it creates what we call the Chazaka, a precedence, an obligation. We too need to recognize, just like our ancestors, that everything, Everything is in the hands of God. He is our true leader, the answer to all of our problems. So let us cry out to our Father in heaven and say, enough. It has become obvious that the only solution to the problems that face our world today is the coming of Mashiach Tzikainu. We are ready. And the time, the time is now. Thank you very much for listening. May God bless you and yours with safety and health and happiness. And again, thank you very much for attending. God bless and have a good Shabbos.